someone who prefers not to design or to build, but to research, to write and to teach. Good evening. Welcome uh, to the third series, the last series uh, in the lecture feature, I Prefer Not To, uh, by Studio Swinnen. Um, I think this semester we have a rather, maybe heterogeneous, but very exciting, uh, I think, selection. So tonight, Martin Del Bacon, something fantastic. Andri Sala, who will be here with uh, Andreas Ruby, and uh, our last intervention uh, will be Finn Williams from the UK. Tonight, we have the enormous pleasure of uh, welcoming Martin Del Beke. Uh, maybe funnily enough, uh, both we, I mean, we're Belgian, come from Brussels, but we've never interacted uh, this much uh, since, uh, I mean, being here in Zurich. So it's a kind of uh, rather exotic um, uh, place to uh, talk about architecture. The topic of the lecture series, I prefer not to, of course, stems from this uh, novella by uh, Melville, uh, Bartleby the Scrivener to which uh, Martin tonight will also refer. Um, this novella, we at least in interpreted as a kind of uh, positive resistance to all too conventional expectations you might have from the architectural discipline. Architectural dis discipline, let's say, from uh, uh, practice uh, to theory. And for that reason, we also find it uh, important that at least for each of the three seasons, we have at least one architectural historian not to brand him, in this case, Martin, as an architectural historian, because we feel um, this kind of uh, approach, A, is maybe not included enough in uh, uh, current practice, and B, I think it's uh, highly uh, important to get this kind of uh, uh, view and feedback. Uh, Martin, Martin Del Bacon, is rather new in that sense at ETH, he's professor in history and theory of architecture. Um, he also is, at least this is how I knew him uh, prior, an architecture critic who I value um, very high. Um, publishes on history and theory of art uh, and architecture from early modern period up to the present, which is rather wide, but um, I think uh, with a very specific interest in also Baroque uh, uh, period. Uh, founding editor-in-chief of the Architectural History is an online open access journal of the European Architectural History Network, and I would advise you to check this. So this Architectural Histories. Uh, co-author and co-editor of several books, I'm gonna name only four, so the list is uh, far longer. Um, the Art of Religion, Sforza Pallavicino, and the Art of Theory in Bernini's Rome from 2012-16. Bernini's Biographies from 2006. Foundation, Dedication, and Consecration in Early Modern Europe from 2012, and the Baroque in Architectural Culture, 1880 until 1980 from 2015. Um, before Martin, we had Philipp Ursprung, and we had Laurent Stalder as uh, architectural historians, all from the GTH. Um, again, this is not a, a haphazard choice. And uh, also, I think, even tonight, Martin, maybe in a kind of complementary line with uh, Philipp Ursprung's lecture, we'll talk about uh, the novella, Bartleby the, the, the Scrivener, um, so which I'm really, really curious to hear. So, Martin, very welcome. The floor is yours. Um, thank you. It's a, it's a real pleasure to be here for... Um, <clears throat> at least two reasons. Uh, one is uh, that I um, read and thought about the, the novella or the short story already a while ago, and I think it's, it's really uh, uh, an amazing story, so Bartleby. Secondly, uh, uh, <laughs> um, yeah, we're ready, finished. Uh, no, a second, uh, that I find it very interesting to participate in a lecture series that is part of, of, uh, of studio work, uh, of, uh, uh, and which also is a kind of program for studio work that runs over uh, several uh, uh, semesters. Yeah, and thirdly, it's always nice to be amongst the Belgians here, so that's also good. Okay, so I'll start. So uh, as Peter already indicated, I'll try to develop a reading of the Bartleby story. If um, 
there are things unclear about the story. Please interrupt me so that I can uh, elucidate. Um, um, and I, uh, I use the, um, the story as a, as a way to reflect on the relationship between the architectural historian and uh, the architect. Hmm? So, uh, let's start. Um, if, as it is says here, uh, if architecture is the yes profession par excellence, yeah, uh, is then uh, architectural historian the I prefer not to uh, profession? Uh, especially in the case of historians, like me and many others, uh, Laurent is also uh, uh, an example, uh, who train as architects but preferred not to build but to teach and uh, research. So, who basically prefer to cast away years of training in structural engineering and soil mechanics to venture in, uh, uh, into a field for which they are barely trained at all. Hmm? Also to, to forfeit the pleasure of realizing real things in the real world. Yeah? That's something that people still ask me, uh, do you miss building? Now, to get that out of the way, no, because I never really built in the first place. Uh, and second, because I uh, also never felt the desire and, uh, or the capacity to do so. But so this question, uh, uh, if architecture is the ultimate yes profession, is architecture history in the, I, I prefer not to profession, is what I want to explore uh, this evening with you. Uh, as a brief reflection, and it's really an open reflection on what might drive historians and on the relationship between architects and architectural historians and how they position themselves with regard to each other and each other's work. Um, now, the brief of this lecture series uh, puts forward the question of action uh, and agency, or you could say rather the relationship between action and agency. Yeah? The difference of agency uh, exerted by saying yes, uh, you, you exert agency by engaging, let's say yes, or exerting agency by uttering the incomplete sentence, I prefer not to, which is also a form of agency. Now in architecture, uh, the role or place of architectural history and of architectural historians with regard to practice and agency, elicit continuous discussion and concern. One only needs to think of what we've been talking about during the GTA Fumsig um, uh, uh, lectures, and especially the workshop or the roundtable or the summit on Friday. Uh, if architectural historians uh, are prone to saying, I prefer not to, not to build, design, uh, take a position or intervene, there are always voices who say that you may prefer not to do that, but perhaps you should, no? uh, to legitimize your existence, basically. Uh, conversely, when some historians suggest that they prefer not to stand on the sidelines, but to intervene in debates, in competitions, in projects, in studios, there will also always be others who tell them they should, uh, uh, they, uh, should do just that, remain on the sidelines and not bother with um, real architecture. Uh, but before I return to that discussion, I want to address a second and I think related problem. Uh, that of how to write the history of I prefer not to. Yeah? Is it uh, conceivable to think and write a history of architecture or of architects that preferred not to? Uh, how to write the history of an absence of action or of actions that stem in some way or another from the wish yeah? or the desire to decline an invitation? And so thinking about this problem, and that I'll do uh, by reading Bartleby, might help us to frame our first question, uh, if architecture is the ultimate yes profession, and architecture historian, I, I prefer not to. So to explore uh, how one could or could not write the history of architects that preferred not to, uh, I return uh, to the story of Bartleby uh, from which the utterance is taken, as is projected here. It's actually, the full title is quite important, but part will be the Scrivener's story of Wall Street of 1853 by Melvin. Now, um, to dive into the story, so Bartleby is a clerk eh, or a scrivener, someone who writes and who works for a master of the chancery, which is a kind of notary, someone who uh, registers legal briefs. Eh? So Bartleby is extremely productive and efficient until the moment when the narrator, his boss, so the story is, is told by this master of the chancery, 
until his boss asks him to assist in the verification of copies of legal documents, which is a tedious job that needs to be performed by the entire office. Uh, office. So it's basically a job where someone reads out a text that has been copied and everybody goes through the copies to make sure that they are all identical. So on this request, Bartleby replies, I prefer not to. And the narrator can't convince him otherwise. And after this first incident, uh, incident, the number of tasks that Bartleby is still willing to perform continues to diminish until he does nothing at all. Uh, now, this story has been told probably in, in various ways uh, across this lecture series. But what I would like to emphasize is that Bartleby's increasing passivity, so his increasingly uh, refusal to work, is matched by his progressive taking possession of his workspace. Yeah. Uh, from the beginning, uh, Bartleby takes up, an, takes up an exceptional position in the office. Uh, so the office of this master consists of two rooms, which are separated uh, by sliding doors. And so the master is in one room, the, his clerks, his other clerks are in the other, and the door is opened or closed as the narrator seems fit. But Bartleby immediately gets his own small table in the narrator's room against uh, uh, the wall. And uh, Bartleby and his table are hidden behind uh, a screen, and I quote from uh, the text, I procured a high green folding screen, which might entirely isolate Bartleby from my sight, though not remove him from my voice. And thus, in a manner, privacy and society were conjoined. Yeah? Now, Bartleby, behind his little screen in the corner of, of, of this room, works diligently, almost without moving, so that he is no more present, basically, than a piece of furniture at the disposal of his master. Uh, but what happens with Bartleby's increasing unwillingness to perform any task at all, so this progressive, uh, is that it actually transforms this near invisibility, this near in imperceptibility, into an ever-growing and ineluctable presence. So basically, Bartleby becomes more present as, as he does less. Uh, uh, Melville uh, describes the surprise and astonishment of clients who find in the room of the narrator, behind the screen, a clerk who does not work, uh, uh, which really changes, you could say, the legitimacy of, of the narrator. Uh, his competence is called into question, uh, his ability to uh, manage power relationship within his workforce and so on. But the true measure of Bartleby's presence uh, only emerges when the narrator discovers that Bartleby actually lives in the office. Yeah? Uh, the narrator had already noted that Bartleby was always present on work days. And so there's one at the moment, the narrator says, he was always there yeah? in the morning, during the day, in the evening. Yeah? But when the narrator then decides to visit his office on a Sunday because he has a little bit of time to spare, so he wants to enter, and his key doesn't really enter into the door. And after a bit of fumbling, the door is opened by Bartleby in his shirt sleeves. And this he says, okay, Bartleby says to the owner of the office that he can't come in because uh, Bartleby is still uh, has business to attend to. Yeah? So the uh, uh, narrator is entirely flabbergasted. Uh, and so he's so flabbergasted that he actually leaves, so he obeys Bartleby. Uh, he walks around and then he comes back and by that time Bartleby has left. And inside the narrator discovers to his shock traces of a domestic life, literally in the nooks and crannies of the office. And this is the... Uh, yeah. So upon more closely examining the place, uh, I surmised that for an indefinite period Bartleby must have ate, dressed and slept in my office. And that too without plate mirror or bed. Yeah the cushioned seat of a rickety old sofa in one corner, not corner, bore the faint impress of a lean reclining form. And rolled away under his desk, I found a blanket under the empty grate, a blacking box and a brush on a chair, a tin basin with soap and a ragged towel. In a newspaper, a few crumbs of ginger nuts and a morsel of cheese. Um, so this discovery really reverses the relationship between the narrator and Bartleby completely. Uh, increasing irritation eh, about Bartleby's gentle refusal to work morphs into sincere concern about the situation and especially about Bartleby himself. 
Yes, thought I, it is evident enough that Bartleby has been making his home here, keeping Batcher's Hall all by himself. But immediately then, the thoughts came sweeping across me. What miserable friendlessness and loneliness are here revealed? His poverty is great, but his solitude, how horrible. Think of it. Of a Sunday, Wall Street is deserted as Petra, and every night of every day is an emptiness. This building, too, which of weekdays hums with industry and life, and nightfall echoes with sheer vacancy, and all through Sunday is forlorn. And here Bartleby makes his home sole spectator of a solitude which he has seen all populous, a sort of innocent and transformed Marius brooding amongst the ruins of Carthage. For the first time in my life, a feeling of overpowering, stinging melancholy seized me. So what the story suggests, I think, is a kind of proportional relationship of Bartleby's inactiveness and his uh, appropriation of the office, of a kind of impassive presence and his total identification of his living and working space. So, so his living and working space merge together as he becomes this kind of massive thing that just sits in uh, that room. And obviously this, this um, situation ends into a kind of insoluble deadlock. Yeah? The total identification of Bartleby's entire life with the office space leads to overpowering melancholy in the narrator, but also obviously to re uh, rebellion of the other clerks. They say, if he doesn't have to work, why should we? Yeah? Uh, I mean, basically you, you sense that the whole office is falling apart. <laughs> also, everybody starts to use the, word, the verb to prefer yeah, compulsively. I prefer that you work, but I prefer not. So uh, in every sense, so there's a kind of uh, uh, crisis in, in, uh, in the office, and it, it is because you, in the, the office you have this presence that never moves. Yeah? Uh, ultimately, the narrator attempts to end the deadlock by moving his office to another location where the old regime of work and hierarchy can be re-established. But there, the narrator is still chased by the new tenants of his old rooms as Bartleby just stays there yeah? in, in, the, in, in, the, in, in the old office. And then in an ultimate attempt to deflect destiny, the narrator offers the clerk a uh, to live in his own house, in his private house, so to take him with him, uh, thereby completing actually the, 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 the total identification of domestic life and domestic space and workspace that Bartleby's impassivity instated. But Bartleby refuses to come along, and as the narrator feared, he is then arrested by the police on the orders of the, uh, of the uh, uh, new tenants and thrown into jail. And despite the narrator's best efforts, Bartleby dies there a few, uh, a few days later. So obviously, as this lecture series and also uh, an, a sizable portion of literature demonstrates, and there's an awful lot that can be said about this story. What I want to uh, uh, emphasize... Uh, um, sorry... Uh, I want to em emphasize the coincidence of Bartleby's entire uh, life with his refusal to act and with the appropriation identification of the room where he works. So these th three things basically form one whole. Eh? So, uh, so the life of Bartleby is defined by his refusal to act, and through his refusal to act, this life and the room become one. And this coincidence uh, established establishes, I think, a very tense relationship between things that can be ascertained, verified, and narrated, things that are present and can be transformed into a history, and the things that remain hidden and unsaid. So on the one hand, there is uh, Bartleby, who is visible, almost palpable, you can almost feel him, uh, sitting at his desk doing nothing, uh, performing no action, generating no story, and then there is a hidden life that unfolds in the same space of the office, invisible, eh? at night, during Sundays, when no one else is around. Eh? And this life can only be uh, imagined, and if it's imagined, it will be imagined incompletely and inaccurately. Eh? And to some extent, I think there exists a kind of analogy between the hidden and lonely life of Barnaby and the rooms that are left empty after work, and the suspension in the very sentence, or in the very utterance, I prefer not to. I mean, it's an incomplete sentence with a suppressed verb or a suppressed conjunction. I prefer not to do this, or I prefer not to, but. 
And these suppressed words mirror, to some extent, the hidden life that takes place outside the view of the narrator or the reader of the story. But it's these hidden things that weigh uh, all the time on the office and on the story. Now, this problem yeah, uh, posed by Bartleby, that his presence is not part of history, yeah, because actually what is real history or what could be told is invisible, because in the things that you can see there's no action, is actually exactly what the narrator tells us at the beginning of the story. Um, um, yeah. Well, of other uh, law copyists, uh, he writes, I might write the complete life yeah? of Bartleby. Nothing of that sort can be done. I believe that no materials exist for a full and satisfactory biography of this man. It is an irreparable loss to literature. Bartleby was one of those beings of whom nothing is ascertainable, except from the original sources, and in his case, those are very small. What my own astonished eyes saw of Bar Bartleby, that is all I know of him, except indeed one vague report which will appear in the sequel. And we, uh, so there's actually one piece of historical information, actually more a rumor about Bar Bartleby uh, that, is, uh, uh, that is relevant, and uh, we'll return to that in a moment. So the point made here, I think, is encapsulated in the sentence, eh? what my own astonished eyes saw of Bartleby, that is all I know of him. Eh? The most lasting imprint that Bartleby appears to have made beyond what could be immediately observed, eh, what his own eyes could see, is in eh, the cushioned seat eh, of a rickety old sofa in one, one corner, which bore the faint impress of a lean reclining form. That's the only trace you could say in history that uh, uh, Bartleby leaves. And even Bartleby's writings consist only of copies of other texts. And as a consequence, it is impossible to write his history or biography, as there are no elements, indications, sources, actions that link the singularity of Bartleby's life to anything other than his e existence in that room. And there is for Bartleby also literally no love, life outside of that room. Bartleby's life unfolds not at the intersection of different networks, social networks, events of storyline, it is what it is. And precisely because the narrator or Melville has chosen to spin a story out of the presence of such non-existence, it is that, of course, that never ceases to fascinate us. Um, voilà. So that was uh, a short reading of Bartleby. Uh, now back to architecture and architectural history. Uh, by means of a probably predictable step, what if Bartleby had been an architect? Uh, and I don't mean to ask what, in that case, Bartleby would have preferred not to build, uh, but question of how his life would have been written. Huh? How would architect Bartleby have entered history? Uh, probably in the same way as his cousin the Scrivener, that is, not at all. Huh? Unless in a compelling piece of fiction. Because whether we like it or not, architectural history is bound up with biography with the life and actions of architects. Uh, refusal, uh, polite but firm, can well occur in a bi biography, but a biography can't be made from refusal alone. In fact, when refusal occurs in a biography, it generally serves to strengthen the narrative of action, of a virtue, and of success. And I just want to illustrate this with one historical uh, example that takes us back to the Baroque. Uh, so it's actually the only example of, of, a, of a refusal to act that I know of in, in, in an 16th or 17th century biography. That doesn't mean that they don't exist. I've never, I definitely haven't read all artists' biographies published in that period. But it's about uh, Bernini, uh, the sculptor, architect, and painter eh, of uh, Baroque Rome. And we'll zoom in... To, in uh, in on one particular episode in his life, which is a moment of failure, so not of refusal. Uh, Bernini was commissioned to design and build bell towers for St. Peter's. Uh, as you all know, there are no bell towers of St. Peter's. Uh, that is because the, they started building them and then uh, the facade started cracking and so they removed these bell towers. So, but at a given moment, uh, there were one and a half uh, 
bell tower. Um, that was not a good moment for Bernini. Uh, so he was obviously accused eh, of incompetence and so on. Eh? And then in the in the biographies of Bernini, oh sorry, yeah, that's the wrong. so in the biographies the the lives of Bernini that were written uh, actually at the end of his life and then published a little bit later. Eh? This whole period is cast as a period of eh, this failure. Uh, so he was cast aside by the Pope. He was out of favor. Um, and he um, sat, sat in his home. And in order sort of to, you could say, process eh, this, um, uh, this moment in his career, he decides to... Um, uh, sculpt a group of truths reve revealed by uh, time. Uh, this is a, a motif eh, uh, with, a, with a very long tradition, but it, it, the, 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 the reasoning behind it is quite obvious. Eh? Uh, it's saying eh, the truth about this whole episode will eventually be revealed eh, by time. Time will sort of show what really happened. Eh? Now, it was supposed to be a sculptural group, and of the, the group, only one part exists, uh, uh, truth unveiled, yeah? a, a naked woman yeah? uh, looking at uh, the sun, the sun casting her revealing light over uh, uh, the woman's body, yeah? and a veil that is being lifted yeah? to uh, uh, show naked truth. But it, this, this was supposed to be part of, an, uh, of a more elaborate arrangement, where actually an equ uh, a similarly si this, this is, um, I mean, probably m many of you have seen this uh, uh, piece in the flesh, which I think is now an appropriate expression. So it's in the Villa Borghese, and it's more than life-size. Eh? So this is a very big uh, statue. Uh, and originally there would have been a similarly sized figure of Father Time hovering above, here, more or less, um, uh, pulling away the veil and at the same time destroying uh, all kinds of architectural fragments, obelisks, temples and so on that would have been uh, uh, sculpted in bas relief that were also necessary to keep yeah, the figure of time floating in the air, yeah, uh, symbolizing yeah, on the one hand yeah, the destructive powers of time and at the same time time's capacity to reveal the truth. And I just give this image because this is uh, a later project for a mirror where you see this uh, motif of, uh, of by Bernini, where you see this motif of um, time unveiling. Uh, and here you see a, a brief description of the group as it was supposed to be um, made in, uh, re uh, recorded in the letter of the 1640s. Um, now, so truth was made, and we also know that Bernini actually ordered a block marble to make the figure of time, but he never came to it, so time was never made. And the question is, why? And if you look at the biographies, they actually devote quite a lot of attention to this whole thing. If you look at the bio biographical story, this is actually the only piece where it is made clear that Bernini did not make a piece that he uh, uh, wanted to make, and um, we can go in. Uh, we could go in, in, into more um, uh, detail, but first of all, it's I think really striking that the episode reveal gets a whole lot of attention, almost three pages in in in, in, the, in the biography, and <clears throat> the way the biographers explain Bernini's refusal. Eh? Uh, uh, to make the, the, the statue is that they say that Bernini hesitated because he did not want to eternalize uh, the destructive force of time. Uh, so the, the showing this figure that would destroy, um, that eventually destroys uh, ever. So he did not want to honor, you could say, the demolisher of monuments. And at the same time, he also, um, uh, it is also emphasized that time as a kind of fleeting entity. Uh, uh, refused to be captured in stone. So it's these two things that are being put forward. Now, again, uh, it's a very interesting piece of literature, the, the, the whole way they try to explain this, this, this refu refusal or this reluctance to sculpt time. 
But the, 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 an important consequence is that the un unworked stone, the stone that was ordered, remained in front of Bernini's house for his uh, entire life. And, and actually, this is a very long poem written in the voice of the stone that lies in front of uh, Bernini's house, crying because it was never made uh, into a statue. So what happened to me? What have I done? Why am I not a statue? Um, um, but well, the consequence of this is, is obviously also because it's so publicized, this whole epi episode, is that the unworked stone in, in, in front of, of uh, Bernini's house becomes a kind of uh, monument to his refusal to sculpt time. And the subtext is actually very clear. Uh, um, uh, it's a statement on Bernini's part that he is the one who controls time. He decides not to make time. And by not making time, it is he, Bernini, and not time, who chooses what to reveal and ultimately how to write his own history. So the example basically shows this. Uh, I prefer, uh, I being Bernini, prefer not to sculpt the statue of time. A polite and hesitant refusal, but which, because also because of the presence of the stone, becomes an affirmative act, a positive statement. Not just an element, but actually the emblem of a successful life embodied in the rock, and the piece of rock in front of Bernini's house. Now, this is only possible. I mean, this transformation of a re refusal into an affirmation is, uh, is only possible if the refusal is an exception uh, or amounts to a vindication of other moments when the ma main pro protagonist said yes, yeah, and emphatically so. So, to jump back then to uh, our friend Bartleby, so if there were real architect Bartleby's who always said that they prefer not to, we will probably never know them. Yeah? So perhaps there exists a shadow universe of architects who have preferred not to, um, whose non, but whose non-action is therefore lost for eternity, devoured by time. Uh, perhaps they have left traces uh, in all kinds of processes or uh, whatever, but that we can not connect back to the agency that they have exerted through their refusal. Perhaps they exist uh, as a kind of phantoms of history, or perhaps they never existed at all. Yeah? So this is obviously an issue if, of historiography, of how we choose to write history. But I think it's also an issue of architecture and architects, yeah? uh, how architects basically see or project themselves in history. And uh, this brings us back then to the work of historians yeah? and the imperative that his history has something to do with traces, yeah? with actions and deeds that can be recorded and with realizations. Yeah? and to the historian's own ambiguous relationship to action, especially in the field of architecture. Again, in the historian as someone who prefers not to design or to build, but to research, to write, and to teach. Now, uh, until now, I have uh, used the narrator of Bartleby as a stand-in for the historian. Eh? Uh, uh, the, so I have used the narrator eh, of Bartleby, so the, the master as a stand-in for the historian. Eh? as an observer yeah, yeah, who is perplexed entirely uh, by the absence of motivation, yeah, of actions, of traces of life, yeah, and who is moved to deep melancholy for so much nothing, uh, as it eludes his grasp, yeah, uh, and he can only point uh, at uh, lonely desolation. But what happens if we flip it around? Yeah, as I already suggested at the outset, what if in this story Bartleby is the historian? Um, and there is actually some ground in the history for this identification. Eh? And this is actually the only snippet eh, of historical information that the narrator finds about Bartleby. So at the very end of the story, eh, he, uh, he, um, he tells us this. Eh? It's a long text, but we're going to read it anyway because it's really beautiful. Yet uh, here I hardly know whether I should divulge one little item of rumor which came to my ear a few months after the Scrivener's decease. Upon what basis it rested, I could never ascertain, and hence, how true it is, I cannot tell. But inasmuch as this vague report has not been without certain strange suggest suggestive interest to me, 
However said, it may prove the same with some others, and so I will briefly mention it. The report was this, that Bartleby had been a subordinate clerk in the dead letter office in Was at Washington, from which he had been suddenly removed by a change in the administration. And when I think over this rumor, I cannot adequately express the emotions which seize me. Dead letters. Does it not sound like dead men? Conceive a man by nature and misfortune prone to a pallid hopelessness. Can any business seem more fitted to heighten it than of continually handling these dead letters and assorting them for the flames? For by the cartload they are annually burned. Sometimes from out of the folded paper the pale clerk takes a ring. But the finger it was meant for perhaps moulders already in the grave. A banknote sent in swiftest charity. He whom it would relieve, nor eats nor hungers any more. Pardon for those who died despairing. Hope for those who died unhoping. Good tidings for those who died stifled by unrelieved calamities. On errands of life, these letters speed to death. And then the famous end, O Bartleby, O humanity. Ah, ah Bartleby, O humanity. Now, now, collecting and dispensing uh, ends of histories, dead ends that disappears, histories that are never written. This capacity is what Bartleby brings to the office as one who politely refuses to take part in the daily life around him and sits increasingly mobile at a small table right next to the action behind his green folding screen. Now, if Bartleby is a, uh, is a sort of paradigm for the architectural historian, it does not bode well for our uh, physical and mental health uh, or for our happiness. Um, but it also implies that doing history not only originates in, but also consists of a refusal. Huh? So it's not just the initial decision to forfeit practice, uh, saying, okay, after five years or six years of study, I'd say, I'm not going into practice, but I go into history. But that history, architectural history of it itself is a practice defined by refusal. Uh, now, even if this view of architectural history sounds a bit harsh to architectural historians, um, I propose to consider it for a moment uh, and not primarily to refute it because m maybe there's some value in it. Uh, in any case, the view or the opinion that practicing history is a form of withdrawal and you could say continuous refusal exists. Yeah? If you think of the way uh, Manfredo Tafugi's turn to architectural history of the Renaissance has been interpreted yeah, as a turning away from an activist Marxist historiography in favor of a more detached form of history writing with no incidents on the present. Yeah? I mean, this reading of Tafugi has been laid to rest by Andrew Leach and others, but it is telling that a turn towards history often incurs the suspicion of disengagement. So let's use Bartleby, and this is uh, my concluding thought, as a, uh, to get a better grasp of the possible meanings and the potential of a withdrawal from action. Yeah. As we have seen, Bartleby's progressive withdrawal from work is proportional to the increasing identification with his room. Yeah. His passivity increases his presence, yeah. not as an active agent, but as something that perhaps resembles Bernini's unmade statue of time, yeah. a rock that just sits there. But as such, in the story, as an obstacle, you know, it elicits increasingly frenetic activity. And the narrator uses the word a torrent, yeah? a torrent of, uh, of upheaval in the office. Yeah? Um, uh, or, uh, so it goes from the upheaval in the office over the move of the narrator to other premises and all subsequent vicissitudes to the final events of Bartleby's eventual removal, imprisonment and death. Yeah? And with this torrent, uh, if you read the story, comes the increasingly tormented examination of conscience of the narrator. So he, he really turns into himself and asks himself, am I doing the right thing? What can I do? Uh, what do I feel? Uh, uh, how, how should I behave? Yeah? So he incessantly ponders the morality and effectiveness of his own actions. Yeah? So you could say that the, the dead presence of, of, uh, of the immutable presence of Bartleby makes the others alive. So this is perhaps uh, where Bartleby the historian takes us. Yeah? And this is yeah, if Bartleby would be our role model. Yeah? First of all, he takes us to the dead letter office. Yeah? So he asks us to take care of dead letters. And he actually says that that's something worth living for. 
rather than copying text. He also invites us to be present, eh? to sit there, eh? uh, polite, eh? uh, um, but eh, with, with reluctantly. Eh? And he also think as he asks us, the historians, to sit in the space occupied by the people of action eh? and be there. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Martin. Um, it was a very dense lecture, so I think a lot of th things to think about and to discuss. Um, and maybe just to start, I hope, because we're, we're, uh, we have, a, I think, a good crowd, a very intelligent crowd, so I'm, I'm uh, not demanding, but I'm, I'm craving for some uh, also reactions and questions uh, later on. Maybe just to start mm -hmm. a small discussion. Um, I think you could read I prefer not to as a kind of withdrawal, mm -hmm. which I think is a far too kind of negative and mm -hmm. passive yeah. uh, reading. Um, as you said, let's say a subtle gain of control mm -hmm. is I think a much yeah. more kind of appropriate way of yeah. uh, addressing the issue. Um, also this, what you said uh, almost in the last sentence, a kind of invitation to be present but in a very different um, mm -hmm. yeah. manner. Mm -hmm. in that sense, to make a very clear difference and to temporize the process. Yeah. Yeah. So this is what I understand by gaining control. Is and maybe also, let's say, when we started the lecture series initially, of course, there were a couple of hunches, intuitions, uh, wishes and frustrations, let's yeah. say. Um, the link to Bartleby could be this kind of implicit wish to be able as architectural discipline to temporize yeah. certain processes, yeah. which... In reality, I think we're not very able to do yeah, so, sure. yeah. uh, at least from the practice point yeah. of, of uh, view. But you mentioned that uh, maybe as an exception, yeah. it, or this is how I understood it, that yeah. it may be powerful. Yeah. But what if uh, it's not an exception, it's maybe not a new normal, yeah. but what if, let's say, as a discipline, that I prefer not to attitude to say, well, give us time to yeah. reflect on certain things because yeah. it's not about pure refusal. Yeah. Um, and you as an architectural historian, historian, what if you also would, let's say, look at the present, the current condition yeah. of the discipline? Yeah. Um, if this would be done, let's say, on a more, on a bigger scale, on a more impactful scale, uh -huh. because now I think not a lot of architects, practitioners say, I prefer not to. Uh -huh. That's my simplistic reading. Yeah. Of course, under the radar, they do a lot of mm -hmm. kind of, uh, I prefer not to, and... Um, but could you imagine that it becomes a kind of something that you can almost, well, maybe not teach, but also offer as a kind of attitude? Or is it linked to a personal inclination, you think? Well, um, I mean, obviously, uh, just also to clarify what I've tried to do here, I mean, this is, um, I mean, I, I, I myself consider this as a kind of rumination on the story uh, uh, where I, I think I want to say two, uh, reflect on two things, and uh, one thing is this um, um, strange uh, evaporation of, of, of borders, basi basically, between different spaces and between different um, uh, states of the same person. Uh, uh, so, again, what I, what I want to uh, think about is... Um, what if you um, take the fact that uh, Bartleby uh, sits there always 24-7 yeah, in that room, if you take that as a starting point of how uh, um, a dialogue, but also a power relation, uh, an exchange between different actors in, in a certain field uh, 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 takes place. And then secondly, to uh, come back to your uh, question, I don't think it's... Um, I mean... The compulsion towards action eh, uh, is something that uh, obviously it depends from one person to another. I mean, we all have it in, in different degrees, but it's also something that is uh, inescapable. I mean, um, uh, and 
for any number of reasons, because of the way uh, society works, because of the way we are uh, validated, because of the way uh, uh, we sort of position ourselves. But sort of the, the layer that I want to add, I mean, or the suggestion I, I want to add, is also because I think we, uh, um, in one way or another, uh, consciously, unconsciously, um, uh, deliberately, or automatically project ourselves into history. Yeah? So you, you become part of a process that will at some point be part of a, of a, of a history. Yeah? And I mean, we, we were having this conversation this morning uh, on the bus. Uh, <laughs> about, uh, very yeah, very early. Um, where, where you were talking about what you do with the studio and you say, okay, these things, uh, I initiate the things in the studio and then they, they sort of linger and then Two years later, perhaps if something will uh, remain, and then for me, both as a historian but also as an architect, and you could almost say as a as a as a human being, you wonder. Uh, uh, that makes me wonder how you um, um, uh, how you frame that and how, how you uh, uh, give that meaning. So how that how that would enter into uh, uh, a kind of uh, uh, into a history of the profession or of architecture uh, or so on. So in that sense, I think there, there are many reasons why uh, we can't uh, be Bartleby. Yeah? Uh, and, and that we, we, we almost have the compulsion not to be Bartleby, just to say, pre, uh, uh, to say I prefer to, or I prefer not to, but yeah, I'll do it anyway. Um, um, uh, uh, so, so that that it's always something that is uh, that can only uh, exist as an exception is not the right word, but as something that sort of kicks against something else. Uh, but what? Okay. Just think about it. Some thoughts or questions. So I see between you two, uh, or the text, I would say, and maybe your advocacy for preferring not to do things, mm -hmm. a major difference, and mm. you may correct me. Mm -hmm. So on the text, I see that he doesn't really care about history, of, no. about being part of history. Yeah. And his presence, he cares maybe about his presence, maybe not, we don't know, we, mm -hmm. we won't find out. Yeah. But uh, the thing is, not doing something, in your case, I think, is about making history or affecting history. So, for example, by choosing not to build a wall, mm -hmm. you make, you affect history, and it's... A, soci a social perspective of not doing something. It's, uh, and the other one is a very personal one. Mm -hmm. It's, I am here, I'm present, I live my life, I don't care about history, I don't care about leaving traces. Yeah. So, there is no question associated with it, but maybe <laughs> something <laughs> yeah. as, as a thought, and whether we should... What what it means for caring and where we start that that's what it is. Mm. The problem in my case it's a more philosophical problem whether we really want to have to see our presence here as a service to mm. subsequent generations uh -huh. and, yeah. or our own society or as not this thing maybe a reflection on other things mm. but not wanting to leave traces. Yeah. And that's something that I think in our society is a given, that we really want to leave traces, and that's yes. our purpose of life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah. that doesn't have to yeah. be. Yeah. yeah. Um, yes. Um, uh, no, no, you're, uh, uh, I agree with... Uh, with your reading, and in that sense, I think uh, that's actually the reason why I think that the story is so so valuable because it uh, it's um, 
puts that problem very. I mean, uh, what, what you see in, in the in the problem is a kind of um, um, despair on all levels by all actors involved around Bartleby, sort of to be able to deal with this because because it's so. Um, Almost counterhuman yeah, the, 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 uh, 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 this behavior, but but then again, so that that makes uh, that that makes me wonder yeah, uh, from the point of view of of of, of the architectural history, but also someone who is involved in architecture, who you how you can uh, turn it into a, a program, yeah, and so on, on what kind of uh, premise that can be sort of. Uh, 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 turn into um, uh, a program. Is it something that is? Uh, but it's basically again your your question. Is it something that is essentially private, yeah? uh, or something that occurs or, or happens, or or is it something that that, that can be uh, uh, structural? Yeah? Um, um, but then maybe that's like, um, I think. The premise of this lecture series is in a voluntary way almost wrong, let's say, or, well, not. it's, um, uh, for instance, if you read this first, mm. this initial text, mm. uh, this is not what I believe. Mm. This is more a provocation, just mm. to get the discussion started. Um, and this is not an excuse, this, this is something really uh, voluntary. Uh, for instance, Philip Oersprung also tackled this issue, mm -hmm. and I was very glad that he did. Um, so that's, uh, that's one thing. I agree with the fact that if you read the novella as such, it's a highly personal matter. Um, still, uh, I am interested uh, beyond the question of philosophy because I, maybe I refuse to believe that it's only a let's say, property of, of the domain of philosophy. So let if, what if we speculate and what if we would um, try to couple it with certain, and in this case, architectural discipline and some of the uh, um, people we invite are also um, artists. Um, could there be a relevance or could there be a problematization? That's maybe more, more important. So we're not looking for answers. We're not looking for perfect matches of like, aha, mm -hmm. this is maybe how we could use, I prefer not to or whatever. That's not of uh, our interest. But I'm really interested in, I mean, so far we've been, I think also very lucky with the very different readings that we got vis-a-vis -vis this uh, theme, the problematization and a kind of very subtle injection into the discipline or the relation with the discipline. And so for me on that level, it's already a big success almost. You know, we, the establishment of in total 12 lectures, 12 kind of very personal attitudes uh, often. I think all of them so far they were very personal. So in that sense, it relates back to this novella for me, but I'm not looking for literal connections or, but still somewhere at the back of my mind, I mean, there is something like, I prefer not to, what if this could be a kind of uh, generating attitude, so beyond the purely personal, in relationship to the idea of a service profession, which is architecture. But this is more a personal, um, yeah fascination, frustration, question, or whatever. Uh, so this is not something that uh, uh, we can uh, solve uh, if this would be the issue. And yeah, uh, I think so far also all the discussions have been all radically different, mm. which is, I think, a very good sign. Uh, to the, to the but in that sense, I, 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 I want to ask that. you. <laughs> uh, what's up? Wait, wait. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I want to ask you to what to what extent you think it's something that is specific to architecture? Uh, so what you put on the table as, a, as an... Um... I, I, I hope it's not specific to architecture. Mm -hmm. uh, but since we are in an architectural environment, uh, yeah. let's take, let's say, the gamble to, to focus on architecture. And there, I personally see a huge potential mm -hmm. um, not to prove the attitude of I prefer not to write, mm -hmm. but to cultivate it and mm -hmm. to really scrutinize it and to, um, to problematize again this notion. I don't think we do this enough. I don't think it's, it's really, really present. Uh, um, I mean, um, uh, the, the, 
semi question I asked you before uh, about control, for instance. Yeah. I see a potential there to, to regain some, some valid, important, mm -hmm. yeah. urgent control. Yeah. Um, but again, if, if the exceptions are uh, the rule, then it's, yeah. uh, it goes back to the philosophical question of the, the, the individual. Yeah. So my, my purely very personal interest would be, could this be a kind of communal project almost yeah. to start to uh, not implement it, but um, to activate it yeah. as, a, as a possibility. Today, it's not, I don't think it's a possibility because it, uh, it's practiced through these very uh, highly personal individuals. Mm -hmm. um, so it's in that sense of no... Uh, uh, fundamental use to architecture, for instance. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, it's. Yeah. I'm, I, in that sense, I do. I'm looking for some kind of connection, just to. So, so I'm so li I'm so literal in that sense. I'm trying to, but I know in advance that it's, it's uh, it will fail this kind of uh, search. But that's not a problem, I think. Yeah. Um, I'm going to ask you a question. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, um, uh, I mean, obviously, one of the things that uh, uh, really strikes you when you read I mean, this this story is the uh, a high and at times almost uh, unbearable um, level of uh, discomfort, yeah? and also the the, the narrator um, um, and in the beginning makes it very explicit that he, I, I don't remember how he says it, but he says that. He was born to lead an easy life, yeah? and obviously his life becomes uh, uneasy. Well, not, yeah, uh, not difficult, but uneasy uh, because of uh, uh, because of uh, 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 Bartleby. Uh, but is then cultivating a, a, an attitude of prefer not to also um, uh, call or an, um, a call to be aware of, um, in order to put it in very, very general terms our tendency, but also the tendency of, of, of the profession to look for certain uh, comfort zones, uh, for places of comfort, so where we, uh, uh, also in, in a situation where basically, I think, from what I hear, that being an architect is uh, becoming uh, the, uh, more and more difficult because obviously the margin in which you operate within the whole building process becomes uh, smaller and smaller and more embattled. That in order to um, just be able to uh, accept that or uh, uh, yeah. that you look for comfort, yeah. for instance, in, in history or in a certain form of repertory or in, in, or in, in your ability to ac actually still be able to do something. Yeah. Well, uh, I, I really appreciate your uh, uh, um, out outline on Bernini. Yeah. And with time, the, mm. the, the rock, which we, and mm -hmm. also you beautifully uh, expressed it. Mm. Um, that's something you can't calculate, or that you can't be, you can't uh, predict mm -hmm. the effect on the longer term. Yeah. Also, the thing we discussed this morning. I think to allow for such a thing, yeah. which is, I think, becoming a very, very scarce good. Let's say, time. Yeah. Maybe in an implicit way. Mm. So not. I don't think. I personally don't believe in to say I prefer not to in an explicit mm -hmm. way, but maybe in very implicit ways. Uh, I think you can uh, uh, install such a kind of um, length, such a kind of uh, 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 yeah, um, zone for finding freedoms, mm -hmm. although you can't predict which will be the where, to, where you will find it. Yeah. It's maybe not very clear what I'm saying, but um, uh, the instant gratification, the instant yeah. kind of yeah, action, yeah. Yeah. I think we, not, and we I mean we as a discipline, mm -hmm. in the yeah. full width, yeah. so not only practice, yeah. we lose a lot of, uh, I think, potential, yeah. an enormous potential. Mm. But that's, um, who agrees or disagrees or kind of... Uh, <laughs> For instance, yeah. Yeah. Common decency. Yeah.
You have to repeat it. Um, sorry if you didn't hear me. I wondered if you, you, it would be actually beneficial to think about we prefer not to because if you're mm -hmm. talking about the effects of these acts on time, I mean, history has shown us that collective acts can actually have the greatest impact on the future, you know. So I wonder if that's also something worth discussing, the idea of collectivization or group action in refusal. Because, I mean, this is a very, very personal story. This is a very, we talked about personal and individual preferences, but I wonder if there's a kind of more political aspect to this. So it's not what you think about, I prefer not to, it's what we think about it and how we agree to do something on that. I said this was the last series, but maybe we'll have a next series and I'll invite you for a lecture and the title is We Prefer Not To. I'm actually waiting for such kind of uh, intervention almost. So yes, thank you for that. But of course, I think in architecture it's impossible. We prefer not to, but that's my... Uh, uh, Martin, thank you very much. Yeah, um, we like to see you back on the, I think, 7th of November for something fantastic. Uh, we are teaching at the chair of Mark uh, Angelil, which will be, again, a very different take. Maybe it's, uh, we prefer not to. Let's see. Thank you very much. Have a good evening. Bye.